Hey guys, Sam here with Scrappy Industries. Welcome back to our Bay City engine rebuild series. If you guys caught the last video, we originally planned on just taking the greater engine, using the front cover, front mount off the Bay City engine, and basically just swapping that engine in whole as is. But because of a lot of differences in these two engines and not wanting to fabricate our own mount, we decided that the easiest way to go about this would be to use the grader as a rebuild kit for the base city. And what I mean by that is more or less all the work of getting the grader home, tearing the engine out, tearing that engine down, all we're gonna use are the six pistons and six liners that are in the grader and put those in the base city block. So follow along, let's get her torn down. I grabbed a new parts washer, which is Matt's old parts washer. I think that's gonna help us out a lot in this process. What have we drug home now? So wait. So you guys may have seen by now or may not have, not sure how the timing of this has worked out, but Matt got himself a real nice new parts washer and we got the scraps and we're pretty excited about it. So this is the old washer he had. It's still an automatic hot water style washer. The bottom spins. There's a row of nozzles on this pipe and down the side. Basically it gets real hot, I think around 180 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Put your parts in there. That pump that has bearings that are about to explode. Push the water through those nozzles and cleaning happens. The guy's even nice enough to give it to us with a plug that plugs right into the wall here. So we're gonna set it over there. I'm not sure if that's gonna be its permanent home, but we'll get it set right there. We can always move it around with a forklift, plug it in and get her preheating. Watch out, Yogo. Do we have enough cord, Yogi? Oh yeah, look at that. Well, we're cooking up our first batch of goodies. This is more of a test run than anything. This is one of the greater rods. We have a Bay City piston and a greater piston. I just want to get this thing roughly cleaned up. We're going to take the rings off and everything, wash it all separate, but I kind of feel like this is test drive one. When I looked up the soap that Matt had in here, it appears to be safe with aluminum and everything. Some of the soaps aren't. I was slightly concerned about that, but I think we'll be just Jim Dandy to that point. <laughs> Maybe we'll keep the one piston we definitely need out for test drive one. <laughs> Sounded like something already fell. <laughs> he ejected the piston right off there. There's a lot of jets over here spraying this way. Man, does this thing do a nice job. This is one of the Bay City's loose pistons, so we're not going to hurt it holding it like this or anything. I just wanted to kind of try things out. This actually fell off, got wedged down in there, so that's a good thing to try. You got to make sure you have it blockaded in here properly. I'm thinking we need to make basically a circle around the outside out of some expanded metal like this so that parts are less likely to fall off the turntable. Man, this, this washer seems to clean very, very well. I'm impressed. I'm thinking we're gonna wanna take one of these pistons apart just to see. I bet we can drill these out and then I think this is actually threaded. Unscrew that off there. Just out of curiosity. One thing I just noticed here is you can see they stamped the V in this to mark the camshaft side. But see on this part that moves, it's stamped down there. So it was actually back that way. It can tighten up that little bit more. So I'm trying to check out and record the way these rings are to make sure they go back on the right spot. I think I'm just gonna try to keep these per piston. The top ring, we have this dot 
signifying the top here on the main compression ring. This is one of the four and a quarter inch bore pistons out of the Bay City, clearly a 7F cat style number of that era. Tells you over here it's Caterpillar patent, I don't know if that's patent pending, what patent D meant in the 40s. And then I guess that was the actual piston manufacturer's name there on the other side. So that makes me think that this four and a half inch bore piston is really an aftermarket solution of sorts for the 4000 series engines. In the name of science, let's see if we can drill out these divots and take this piston apart. I'm just curious how it's made. I guess this is actually a Caterpillar factory piston we learned from the comments on our last video, which I find interesting to say the least. I wanna drill these out and hopefully it unthreads. I think that's a fine thread. You can see, you can see a little bit of the top of it there maybe. This is going for a ride in the parts washer before it died. But obviously this thing's junk, it's scrap. Let's just destroy it and see what we can learn. I'm gonna try drilling this out with this big drill bit. Well, mainly because that's what was in there. I think we might be about drilling it in half with this drill bit. You can see the threads that are in there. That is wild. Seemed kind of loose there. I might need a little assistance to get this off. Maybe a little blaster wouldn't hurt. Just a little more lubrication of sorts. <clears throat> kind of impressed it's coming that well. Let's use the vise. Don't know if this is going to work or not. And the answer is not. And there we go. Got it. And then that ring land huh, pulled right off. So you can see how they machined this taper into the ring land onto that nut that screws down onto it. If it made it this many years, I wonder if you'd get away just, if you could drill the dimple out with a small, reasonable sized drill bit, tighten that thing down, and then re-somehow lock them. I'm not sure what the best way is. I'm surprised that that indent is what they decided on, but I guess, I mean, it's better than like a set screw or something like that. I even thought roll pin, but again, you gotta consider the temperature extremes that this is under so that's why the dimple probably is the best choice if you're trying to do that but that is our multi-piece caterpillar factory piston i guess these were known to fail we've learned some cool stuff in the comments from our last video squatch 253 definitely has some great info on these i went and did a little research over there and he knows his stuff, so there's a lot to learn about old cats over with him for sure. But basically we just had a, a nut, a steel ring land, and they punched it on there, and it worked until it didn't. My assistant, Yogel. What do you think, Yogi? Let's take out some more pistons. Pretty good scoring on these rod bearings for sure.
just scraping the carbon out of the top of these bores so that the piston and rings can clear it. So we seem to have a couple odd differences on the rods as well. The Bay City so far, all three of its have had this alignment dowel with the cap. So therefore you cannot put the cap on backwards because of that, it has to go on that way. So that way your bearings are always aligned the same. Normally when the rod's machined, they're honing this bore, getting it perfectly true. So if you flip that, it's not really accurate. The circle could be off. As we move down, the and that was grader number two rod, number one grader rod was the same way. As we move down further on the grader, they don't have that dowel pin anymore, and therefore you can put it on backwards. So in order to keep track of that, I'm gonna stamp the numbers on each side, that way we know which rod and cap these are as well, because the grader hasn't been marked. The Bay City had nice stamping, so you knew which number you were on. I think the way to tell which way the cap goes, I was looking at the scoring and paying attention to how I took it off. This has this one, one mark on it, so that way you know you weren't 180 off. Still odd the way these parts and pieces seem to be mashed together. This is 5B420 rod part number. These other rods are also 5B420, so same part number rod even. Must just been a later update. The grader seems to have, uh, so far, a hodgepodge of parts and pieces to it. I'm gonna hold this with the camshaft side where these valve reliefs are to this side. The inspection cover side is on the opposite side of the engine from the camshaft, so that's where I'm gonna stamp our numbers just so it makes more sense. We're probably not even gonna use these rods as long as we don't have any major issues, I want to keep with the Bay City rods. We'll just swap the pistons over, keep the bearings and rods with the original engine. This guy was number five, so I have our number five stamp here. There we go. We're at least on the same page. You can see number three, somebody kind of crudely scratched number three into the rod and the cap. Just odd. I'm gonna go ahead and pull these lock rings out to pull the piston pins. Pull the wrist pin. There we go. As far as keeping the pistons in the exact right number slot with the same sleeve, I don't think I'm gonna concern myself. We're probably gonna end up running a hone through the sleeves to clean them up. These are gonna go on a different rod. I'm gonna make sure the rings stay in the same position in the same groove. I don't think it really makes much difference for what we're doing here. We're not building a NASCAR engine. We're building a 1941 10th year anniversary cat diesel edition. Our next batch of cookies going in. Please don't fall off. Well, she was awesome while she lasted, but the pump has locked up on us. But I can tell you she's proven that we gotta fix her because look how well this thing cleans. This only ran for, I don't know, five minutes? Very impressed. I did pull the O-rings off of the sleeve so that it could clean down in there. That's the greater sleeve and this is the Bay City sleeve. Amazing how much this mud and crud was in there. Well, that's good. We'll be able to get that copper ring off probably doing that and getting them some heat. There we go. I didn't want to hurt those. You can still buy these from Cat, but they're $138 a piece, which I'm not gonna lie, I can't bring myself to spend that on them. 
but I really do not think these are a cat piston. I think this is some sort of an aftermarket deal. WMW on that side with the A1125 part number. The aftermarket big bore kit. Well, college getting us out to pull some more sleeves. Oh, like that one shouldn't take much. Just give it a little tappy. Tap, tap, tap a -roo. We've got to pull this other head off, and that way we can get the rest of the sleeves out. This one's fighting hard to come out because the rings are stuck. This is kind of more what I expected to find. I know that this engine was stuck, locked up at some point in time just from sitting in the weather. See, that ring's free, but that top compression ring is frozen in there right now. Another loose top. Try that. You should be able to pull it. It's amazing it could go through that many heat cycles and still be stuck. Not great. Well, that will. Control ring, it's really tight right there. That was number five. I could only imagine driving these guys by hand. How much whaling you'd be doing on them. I want to see this one. Are we uh, angry again? I think we better grease it again. We had a little galling issue with the old puller. This is the one that had the scored piston. Oh yeah, she is. She's mad. A couple places. Overall, that one is not happy. So I guess that's reason not to just sledgehammer these things free and be happy you got them running because there will be some aftermath to that. That's all the sleeves out of the Bay City. We got five more to pull out of the greater engine. I said, this thing, this thing didn't take near the pulling that the uh, Bay City did. Well, next up is the very exciting, all important task of cleaning up this block. We have our weapons of choice here. I have, these are the Cheapo Depot Amazon Carbide Scrapers. I didn't know I couldn't live without them. See link below, help you guys out as well. And we have our good old fashioned, just regular blade scraper. These are better getting under the gaskets, things like that. So I'm gonna work on cleaning off like our front cover surface, our pan rails. And eventually we're gonna have to clean up the deck surface, which is gonna not be the most fun with all the studs in our way. But we'll get her cleaned up, ready for reassembly. If we were really gonna go nuts, the best answer here I think would be pull the crankshaft, go outside with some good degreaser and the steam jenny and pressure wash everything off. But then we're gonna put dirt into all the oil passages, all those kind of issues. So I don't wanna get into cleaning all that stuff out. The crank bearings and everything seem to be really good, so I just want to leave well enough alone. We'll use the shop vac to help pick things up in around where the sleeves were, and the top of the block is very crusty. I'll show that here in a second, but we're going to have to scrape that out, vacuum that out, and get that all cleaned up as well. That's where the pressure washer would come in handy, but we're going to draw the line somewhere.
This is one of our liners as it came out of the washer. I stopped, kind of scraped this off quickly and let it wash some more, but we're really close. We've got a little bit more carbon to get out of the top. I did run my knife on this inside edge of the lip here on the top of the liner. I want to clean up, I want to clean up this little bit of rust under the flange on the bottom side. And then on the bottom of the liner where the O-rings go, we just got a little bit of cleanup work to do there, but all in all, not bad. So far, I haven't noticed any pitting, any cavitation issues, anything like that. Anything major, anyhow. There's just little minor pieces here and there. Nothing, nothing to worry about. I've taken sleeves out of Cummins before where they were just about all the way through. Actually, the E9 is probably the worst I've ever seen. The E9, I think, had pinholes. I bought that engine out of a junkyard and then rebuilt it before I put it in Superdog, but I believe that had to be why it was parked. It had to have been getting compression in the coolant. It had uh, three or four sleeves on it were super bad pitting corrosion. I think that's caused a lot of times on the higher horsepower engines anyway by low coolant pressure. Basically every explosion you have in here, my understanding is the liners expanding and then snapping back, you know, during the power stroke. When the diameter is actually getting smaller again, it's creating that void in there in the coolant. There's no air, there's no coolant. And as the coolant crashes back into that spot, that's the cavitation you hear of. Is, and it's basically micro sandblasting the liner over time with the coolant in the engine. So yes, additives help with that, but coolant pressure, I believe, is a very big part of that as well. So another thing to note is on these pistons and liners, I don't know how well that'll come through, but we're getting a W, right here you can see, WS256. So that's definitely not a Caterpillar part number. The pistons have a similar number, also not Caterpillar. So I believe this is an aftermarket kit of some sort that converted the 4600 from four and a quarter inch bore as cat would have built it up to four and a half inch bore as the later cat d318s were if anyone has any info on that i'm very interested to know the pistons that were in it were a caterpillar design with that screw on top apparently that's how the older ones were we learned that's pretty cool i didn't know that but no one seemed to comment on this four and a half inch bore that the grader was other than think maybe the military did strange things i kind of doubt that I bet it was rebuilt, you know, relatively not that long ago in its civilian life. And I wonder, you know, who would have made this rebuild kit with the bigger pistons and the bigger sleeves, because that's pretty neat. I don't know if there's any chance they're still available. I kind of doubt it, but it's neat that we're going to have a, evidently a rare big bore 4600 out of this. <laughs> I'm blowing from the bottom up trying to keep the crankshaft clean. I was basically holding my finger over the oil hole on that rod uh, journal and blowing all the dirt out the top. This number one was by far the worst, the way the dirt had packed in around the coolant tube where it runs all the way through the length of the block here. I think, Brian, they never really used antifreeze. They'd put water in probably out of the local creek every day, open the valve, let it drain out, in the winter time when it would freeze and then refill it the next day. And this is the consequence of doing that is you have a ton of dirt and sediment in the whole cooling system. You can see how bad these sleeves are when we pulled them out, but at least this way we're getting everything relatively cleaned out. It's not gonna be perfect in here, but the sleeves are gonna be nice and clean and that's really the important part. All right, will she slide in there? Most of the way. I think that's where the inner flange gets tight on the deck of the block here. Well, not really the deck of the block, but after the counter bore, I think that gets snug. And now it's stuck. 
So Scott's back off of COVID leave, as I feel like I might be entering it. <laughs> what? Working on cleaning the deck of the block here. Oh, I woke up with a runny nose. Stay back, Codge. Getting the block cleaned up. I'm working on cleaning up the liners and pistons. Just a lot of this fun stuff. I think I'm going to try to hone a couple of the sleeves now and see how that goes. Just going to use the vise here to hold that. I'm just going to run motor oil here as our lubricant. See how she does. It's doing a good job of installing our uh, 45 degree cross hatch there. Thinking we can use a bit more of it. So total, I think that's about 15 strokes fully up and down. So if we can keep that consistent across all these, I think we'll take the same amount of meat out of them. If that matters, I don't know, but it didn't clean up perfect, but it looks pretty good. Let's take you guys in there to check her out. Based on how little we've really taken out of this, I'm thinking maybe I'll get a little bit more aggressive with it. This sleeve doesn't have near the pitting and rust marks and everything that that other one did. Let's see how it cleans up. That one cleaned up really nice. Yeah, that one's that one's in really good shape. Well, just like new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these must be aftermarket too. Yeah, I think so. By the numbers. Yeah, it's not a, not a cat number, that's for sure. Where's you going, please? That one needs a good honing yet, real bad. I think as long as that, I was just trying to make sure, yeah, that yeah, little, in, some that little indents clear. A little over in debris left. That's where the copper gasket ends up rotting between the sleeve and the block. I don't really know its purpose. I think that it's still sealing water on this interface fit here. A little bit of pitting on that one too. Yeah. And this is probably the worst one down here. We got the deck surface of the block mostly all cleaned up. Well, I started, Scott finished it today. I think I'm gonna take the wire wheel inside those counter bores yet. And then inside where the liners go, got that pretty well cleaned up. Not 100% perfect. 
So it's much less dirt and crud in there than it used to have. So we are gonna go with the grater heads because they have that O-ring style water seal in them. This is what was in there. You get this little brass dealio. Each one of them has this rubber donut on it in a pretty rough shape. You can still get all these from Cat. No big deal there at all. So I got the new, there's eight big ones and eight little ones. Bought them for these. I don't know if you can buy these or not. I really didn't check. I figured we'll just reuse them. We'll clean these up quick. We were able to get them all out of there without too much trouble. I just snipped these off with side cutters and we'll be ready to rock and roll. This really wouldn't have been a bad job if we didn't start the way we did. The whole front cover, other front cover, camshaft, injection pump, governor, all that could have stayed on there. The only thing we had to pull was the oil pan and the heads. But plans changed. We didn't know exactly what we were getting into when we started. So unfortunately, this is where we're at and we'll put her back together. <laughs> Rings back on piston number one. I abandoned taking the rings off because I was afraid of breaking them. And I think we got everything clean, just Jim Dandy without taking them off. So that's the route we went with. So this side we have all our Bay City parts. And this side we have all of our grader parts. We're gonna try and use most all the Bay City rods. These are the grader rods. As you can see, the bearings are in pretty bad shape, but Regardless, we're going to use the Bay City's bearings. Everything, all of the rods look to be in good shape from the Bay City. Other than number three has a pretty loose wrist pin bushing. So rather than remedy that, we'll just swap over to one of the better rods from the grader. It's kind of our easy solution here. The rods are the same part number as far as all that goes. The wrist pins are thicker from the big bore kit. I'm not sure if that was from the potential expected power increase, extra force on and everything, but this is a factory cat wrist pin from the Bay City versus the grader wrist pin. You can see how much thicker the grader is. Now, so far what we found is the pistons have a different wrist pin diameter on a 318 and a 4600. These ones are inch and three quarter. On a 318, they do have the same pin height, but the diameter of the wrist pin is inch and 13 16 So if you were gonna try to run D318 pistons, I think it's possible if you would just machine the wrist pin bushing out that extra 16th of an inch. There's a fair bit of meat there, so I have a feeling it's possible. But if you ran the 318 wrist pin and bored that out, I think that may be a solution for pistons and then bore out your four and a quarter inch bore sleeves. So right now we're working on putting the pistons on the rods. The connecting rods are symmetrical, but the stamp number side, we're gonna put towards the inspection cover side so that if you pull the inspection cover, you can see the number. Not that that really matters. And then the valve cut out here on the piston needs to be towards the camshaft side of the engine. So we're gonna put the valve cutouts opposite the numbers and they'll be ready to go back in. We're just stealing these rod bearings out of the Bay City with the rat with the bad wrist pin bushing that we're not going to use. I'm trying to be careful here to keep the orientation of everything the same. That's one from the grader that's kind of scored up. That's ready to go back together. And we're gonna need to restamp this because I believe this was the number two rod from the grader was our tightest, tightest wrist pin up here and that was just checking with the wrist pin here. Get all our honing grit out of these sleeves so we're gonna take them for a dunk in some Dawn suds and make sure we get that all cleaned out so they're not grinding on the rings.
cleaned up copper ring. And we got our new O-rings here. These were still available from old Caterpillar. And that's our whole set of liners, pistons and rods, rings all back on and ready to roll. The block's now all prepped and ready to go back together. Might give her one little final vacuuming out in there, but it's way cleaner than it was. You see this coolant tube, it runs the whole length of the block. That's coming off the pump. Thought that's kind of neat how they transported the coolant that whole length. You need to do a little more vacuuming in there and get things cleaned off the crank and the bottom side of the engine yet. Got everything cleaned up. Kind of a final scrape and vacuum. And our liner installation tool. Scott just put tire mounting compound on the O-rings is what we're using for our lubricant there. And we're ready to put our first one in. Probably not. And check our protrusion here. <coughs> this really needs bolted down to give a final check of protrusion, but I kind of want to see. Sitting at ninth hour right now. I don't think this book even gives you a spec on that, but more than anything, we need them to be even within a couple thousandths. Someone's not happy on that one. We're gonna have to pull that one back out. That one's getting like 20 thousandths protrusion where these two are both at nine. It's a bit easier when it's clean. If the copper ring got caught on the way in, but it's all bent up. I think that's part of our problem. Gonna grab another one off the Bay City. I'll just grab us a different sleeve entirely for the time being while Scott's working on a new copper ring. Hi, Yogi. You coming to help? I think I'll sit down on the flat spot. Too much. Put that guy like that. So these are gonna hold the these two sleeves in tight for us to check the protrusion without them coming back out due to the O-rings. Right there at eight thousandths. And that one's at six. I 
that one doesn't take near the hogging on it. So I think we're good to go on these. I'm going to check the bores and make sure we didn't have any uh, O-rings fold over on us. Pushing the sleeve out around. Good to go. We're going to need to clean out these pickup screens somehow too. Run or something. I, think, I think most of that's gasket material though, not metal. Yeah, most of it cleaned up. I'm gonna pre-lube all these rings up. And we have our ring compressor here to put them in. Set our ring gaps, mainly just so they're not lined up. sure our bearings are clean and the crankshaft's clean and then we're just going to pre-lube them with motor oil as well. And we're ready to fire in there. So with this guy we previously aligned that the numbers stamped in the rod go to the inspection cover side which leaves our valve reliefs to the camshaft side. All right, ready? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Need more down. Yeah. Make sure the bearing's good and clean. I think we probably want to do a wet torque on these. And these are 58 foot pounds. We confirmed that with a 318 book. They stayed the same. 58 foot pound and then plus whatever you need to line up the cotter pin on that castle nut. I don't know if too many electronic torque wrenches have been used on this thing. Round two. You got the crank turned to where you want her? Yep. We good. All that compression coming right up. So we have all the pistons and rods back in this thing. That all seems to be working well. Kind of checked all our clearances. All the rods rattle around. Nothing's tight as far as all that goes. So I'm happy there. We've checked our protrusion. We look to be two to three thousandths there. So I think we're just Jim Dandy. Next up, we got to clean this front gear case that goes back on top. We need to clean the oil pan the heads, all that stuff. We got a little more cleaning up to do and then we'll be back on assembly. I just wanted to give some different shots of things turning here. Well, our new burner seems well investment.
So since we can't get any of these gaskets, we're just gonna use some good old Forma gasket here on all this stuff. My only concern with doing that is that we're gonna lose a little bit of height as these tolerances stack up. So we're gonna to have to pay attention to things like the idler gear, make sure they're not in a bind. If they are, we'll have to actually custom make a gasket hammered out of gasket material. But if we can get away with doing this, it's the easier option. And too much. Accessory drive going in next. Now we've got to wiggle this oil line down in here and that's what's lubricating the accessory drive bearings. Sweet. This is the governor, the flyweights fly out, tell it's going faster, which is woe the fuel up when this pushes on the rod that's inside the front cover here. And then that linkage runs through to the front of the rack on the injection pump. Getting ready to put the camshaft back in. Scott's cleaning out the journals. So because of the odd slip-on front gear arrangement, we don't have to worry about timing it until we do that. Now we're setting the crankshaft to top dead center number one. Use our little indicator on the flywheel mark. You want to keep turning there, Scott, and we'll watch this. Our supervisor's here. Hi, Shaver. You give me a kiss? <laughs> So we have the C mark on this guy. It's got to weld up the inside here, weld up the crankshaft. And I don't know, like nothing is really keeping this necessarily right other than until you put the damper on, locks that in position, which, so this idler gear goes on next. This is tightening down our cam retainer bolts. So just sit on it. So. Yeah. Really not too bad. Hit that now. Couldn't have been easier. Couldn't have been easier, he says. Oh man. Meant to lift that way. We're gonna run out of height though, I think. Yeah, maybe not. Hopefully she's right. Well, here at Scrappy Industries, we do her right because we do her twice. And this front cover, no exception. Last night, Scott and I got done putting all this together. We had a good weekend, got pretty much this whole short block assembled over the past weekend, but we have an issue. So under this front cover, there's an idler gear that runs between the camshaft and the accessory drive for the injection pump. And it is kind of squeezed in there, but not really trapped, I guess we'll say, between the two halves of the front cover and the gear case. And because we're not running a gasket, we've lost a 32nd of clearance for that gear. Well, a 32nd is enough clearance that that gear will no longer turn. Reach down in there with a screwdriver, just checking to make sure that gear would rattle around because the engine will still turn over. You can't tell as far as all the drag from the rings and everything, but that idler gear is rubbing, it is stuck. So. If the engine was to run like this, it wouldn't run very long before we would have melted steel and it would weld itself together here, I imagine. So we got to clean off our old gasket maker.
that's the gist of it. I'm going to finish cleaning out our holes and get everything all final tuned up, and I think we're good to go on this gasket. Back on the front cover mission for round two. We've made our fresh gasket, got a fresh tube of former gasket we're going to use to kind of help back this homemade gasket up, mainly down here in the corners. The correct order to this would be put the front cover on, then put the oil pan on, but sort of the way things were going, this was the easier way for us. So I just want to make sure we get these corners sealed up. Let's get her back together. Or just pull her down. If I can just hook right in that, yeah. That'll work, and then I'll just even this out with the sling. So our final steps of putting this engine together, we have the fuel tower to install. Followed by the injection pump. The injection pump has a tang drive on it, which is slightly offset. So more or less, if you time the accessory drive correctly, you cannot screw up timing the injection pump. Start that top one. And these are all up. So we ended up having a last minute audible on using the Bay City heads instead of the greater heads. We chose these ones because back when Grampers pulled them off in the 80s, he had the local machine shop do a valve job on these heads, so they're nice and clean. There's not all a bunch of carbon and soot inside them, and they have good tight valves, good seats, things like that. So we had to reuse the head gaskets that were on it. We just sprayed them down with copper coat, as you saw a minute ago. There she is. And hoping that works out, time will tell. We're on our quest to convert this thing over to electric start. This industrial engine has the cover where the starter goes already in the bell housing where the grater didn't. We had one of these cat electric starters because it's weird with the beveled gear. Matches the bevel of the flywheel. This one was on a D4400 and worked just fine. So we're thinking it should work fine on this one. I like taking the big John roll here. Yeah, camera's so much lighter than that starter. Doing a, doing a wonderful job. So this is our pressurized paint pot nowadays used for diesel fuel. This allows us to fill that with fuel, hook the air hose to it, push fuel up in the tower and through the injection pump to get her primed. Put a couple gallon of fuel in our pot here. Looks like they all have it now.
taking a little bit. Couple sniffs, I guess. Hmm. That's weird. It's about to be too slow. I hope they not tip it over. way to keep it running. when the steam is coming out of the yeah, water yeah. jacket that's enough yeah, it's coming out of the... and to that we say woohoo it's alive i was hoping we'd get it starting a little easier i think there's still some air in the fuel system so you know we're gonna get that worked out see how she ultimately starts hopefully it doesn't need a john deere ether kit at all times on an 80 degree <laughs> summer morning but the good news is it will not be working in the cold weather it is a show may and august machine so it'll be all right I'm super excited we got it running. Everything's all back together. That's gonna wrap up this video. Our next steps, we're gonna steam Jenny this whole thing again, get it cleaned up and paint it without the radiator and the water pump on, and then we'll be ready to put all that back together, put it in the shovel, and I think that'll make the next video is painting, final assembly, and reinstallation. So I'm not sure when exactly that's gonna happen, but I'm happy that we made it this far. We got it running. We have our big bore 4600. I'm Sam with Scrappy. Thanks for watching.